Hello again, this is Susan Davis. Welcome to our webinar today, Quantum Programming on D-Wave. For those of you who've joined us in previous webinars, we're gonna do something a little bit different today. Uh, first, our speaker, let me introduce him, is Alex Condello. Alex is the manager of the Applications Development Technology and Tools team at D-Wave. Uh, one of the things that always happens during these events is we get a lot of questions coming in and never really have enough time to spend answering them. So we thought what we would do today is have Alex present for about 30 minutes, talk about some of the programming tools and software we have available, uh, and then give uh, more of our audience an opportunity to ask questions. So what we want you to do, either while Alex is presenting or thereafter, is enter your question into the Q&A box. Please don't put them in the chat box. Uh, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, after Alex is done, we're gonna open it up to our panel of experts who are at our headquarters location uh, outside of Vancouver, and we will attempt to answer as many questions as we can. Now, many of you have probably spent some time, hopefully, on our Leap Cloud system, so you may have already been working on some uh, programming or gone through our tutorials. So if you have questions related to the D-Wave technology uh, or the tools or Leap itself, we'll be happy to answer as many as we can. So again, you can put them into the Q&A box. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Alex uh, to start our talk today. Hey folks, uh, it's good to be here. So today we're gonna be talking about quantum programming on the D-Wave system. So before we get started, sorry, my uh, slide deck, there we go. Before we get started, um, I just wanna say that almost everything that I'm gonna be talking about today is available in open source. There's documentation online and in Leap. And I really wanna emphasize <clears throat> that we want feedback. We want uh, folks like you to ask questions, to make pull requests, to make bug reports, to tell issues, and really to tell us what we can do to make programming with the D-Wave system easier and better. Because frankly, you know, we're very, hopefully very good at programming the D-Wave, but what we don't know is what your problems are. And what we don't know is how to plug into your stack. And you're the ones who know that. And so the best way that we can help you is by you telling us what we're doing wrong and what we're doing well, good, bad, and different. And it's also worth highlighting that your feedback helps us prioritize. There's a lot of things that we'd like to do and you know, the things that you ask for and the requests that you make and the bug reports that you file, tell us what you think is important. I also wanna just point out where you can find a lot of the information that I'm gonna be talking about in this webinar. So first off, we have our Read the Docs website, which you can find at docs.ocean.dwavesys.com. This is sort of the central place where you can uh, find out information about our tools, about Ocean, about programming the D-Wave system. You know, you can find uh, a getting started guide, examples, all sorts of different resources for getting started on the D-Wave system. We also have our GitHub account, uh, github.com slash D-Wave systems, which is where you can find the repositories for the different Ocean tools that I'll be talking about today. Finally, we have our Ocean landing page, um, which is at ocean.dwavesys.com. You can see sort of a picture of it here on the screen. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, we are working on that right now, and we're gonna be hopefully coming out with like a new and revamped version of it soon. That's something that we're actively working on based on the feedback we've gotten from users. So jumping right in, because, you know, at D-Wave, we pride ourselves on being the practical quantum computing company. And so I really wanna start this off with something that looks like a practical problem. So imagine that I have a network of pipes. What a, a problem that I might wanna solve is to find a minimum set of junctions from which I can monitor every pipe in this network. This is a real problem that real customers wanna solve that you know, different uh, manufacturing groups or oil groups or any of that, they have sets of pipes, they, want it, they know they have to monitor them for leaks and for, for issues, and they wanna do that as cheaply as possible. And I wanna show how you would use Ocean to solve this problem. So first thing is we need to identify what problem it is that we're actually solving. So we have a set of junctions for monitoring pipes, which we're gonna represent with this graph on the left-hand side. So you can see that each of those lines represents a pipe, and each of those circles with a number is a junction. I'm gonna go ahead and label those junctions one through seven, it's completely arbitrary. Those are simply the places where two pipes meet. And the goal is to find a set of nodes, so junctions, that cover every edge. That is, every edge has at least one of those junctions next to it that is marked red. 
is covering it. This is called the vertex cover problem, which is a well-known problem from graph theory. So now I want to show how you would solve this problem with the ocean tools. This is an actual ocean program that you could run in Python today. Um, you could run it right now, in fact that solves this problem. And I'll come back to this image in one moment after I talk a little bit about the way that the ocean tools are organized. So this is an abstract picture of our ocean stack. You can see sort of at the bottom, we have a set of heterogeneous resources. This is CPUs and GPUs, and now because of D-Wave and some of, our other, uh, some of the other vendors, QPUs. One thing that's really, really important to know is that the future of computation is hybrid. There is not a future where we will only be running problems on the quantum processor. And there's not really a future, I think, where we're going to be only running problems on CPUs and GPUs. I think that to do real problem solving in the long run, you're going to need a large set of heterogeneous resources. And Ocean is really built with this in mind. So sitting above the sort of computer resources part of the stack, we have our set of samplers. Now, these are different sort of problem solvers, one of which is the QPU. But we also have some software samplers that make use of CPUs and GPUs. So these are things like simulated annealing or parallel tempering, different algorithms that themselves have strengths and weaknesses for solving the sort of problem that we want to solve. Now, once we have a set of these different resources that we'd like to use, as a computer scientist, the next thing that we want is some sort of uniform API for accessing them, which brings us to our uniform sampler API level which lets us sort of submit problems in the abstract that can be used by some of the different resources. Finally, above that, we have our mapping methods. These allow us to generate problems from things that you would recognize. So like this pipeline problem, or maybe that you're an engineer who works uh, in logistics and you want to map uh, your trucks to different sites as efficiently as possible. Or maybe you want to simulate some sort of quantum uh, material or you have a machine learning problem. We want to reach from our uniform API into these areas so that you, the experts in those areas don't have to become experts at quantum programming. Finally, up at the top, we have a set of specific areas that you know, we are targeting or we would like to target or that you know, users, different applications that users have right now. So you know, for instance, scheduling or circuit fault detection or portfolio optimization or this sort of pipelines problem. So taking this picture and walking back to our ocean, you can sort of see that this is laid out in a very similar way to the picture was. We have here, uh, I hope you can see my mouse. In the middle, we have our D-Wave sampler. This is our resource. This is the thing that we are using to solve the problem. This is an access to the QPU. I will point out that you'll notice here that when you instantiate this D-Wave sampler object, it is making a connection to a quantum processor it is a real-time connection. It, it uses your token, which you can get by signing up with Leap at any time. You get a free minute. You can access the processor you know, within a couple minutes of signing up. Once we have that, that resource and access to the QPU, we want to make it more abstract. We want to make it more accessible to arbitrary problems, which brings us to our uniform sampler API. That's what this embedding composite layer does. This brings the QPU sampler, which is a little bit particular. It wants to receive quantum machine instructions. This brings it up to a more abstract problem, which we'll be talking about in a little while. Next, we have our problem. So I assert uh, that this is the same graph that we saw from before. You'll see that we have the set of junctions or nodes here, so labeled one through seven. And we have their connections. So if there was a junction between one and two, you can see it here as one and two. I'll, I'll note that this is using the Network X library, which is a, a Python library for solving graph theoretical problems out of Los Alamos National Labs. Um, this is a library that's well known in the graph theory community and we've simply plugged into that with our D-Wave Network X package. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel, we want to bring our code to the users, where the users are, and what, you know, not try to interfere with the way they're solving their problems, simply to enhance. So finally, at the bottom here, you'll see the call that actually solves the problem. So I mentioned that this, we have our network of pipes, which is this G. And we have our problem, which is to find the minimum vertex cover of that uh, set of pipes. And we provide our resources here, which is we're going to use the QPU to solve it. And what's returned from this is a cover, so the set of junctions from which you can monitor those pipes. So now 
that was, I think, a little fast. And I think one thing that's worth highlighting is I want to try to give you a sense of what problem we solve. I want to really like try to link the problem that the D-Wave system solves to applications and try to give you some sort of feel for what's the problem we solve and how do we think about solving it. So the place that most people start when they want to think about how the QPU solves problems is this landscape metaphor. So say I have um, a problem and I'm going to define, I'm going to set my problem as, I'm going to think of my problem as defining a landscape where I want to find the minimum, the lowest valley in this landscape. You can think of each solution to my problem as being a coordinate, say like a GPS coordinate across this landscape. And as I walk around the solution space, if my solution is not as good I, or not as optimal, I'm going to be walking uphill. Or if my solution is getting better, I'm going to be walking downhill. And this is the metaphor that I want you to have in mind when you're thinking about how to solve problems on the D-Wave system, because this really informs most of what we do. It's worth highlighting that classical processors fundamentally solve problems by taking single steps in different directions. And so if you have, if you're in one valley and you're in what you think is the bottom of that valley, but there's another valley next door over a ridge line that's slightly lower, you don't have really an ability to see that. You have to climb way, way, way uphill before you can start walking downhill again. And this is the fundamental problem that we're trying to get around with the D-Wave system. So I apologize for the mappiness of this slide, but it's, it's worth highlighting you know, really explicitly to take that metaphor and bring it down to a mathematical expression. This is something called a binary quadratic model. This is the problem that Ocean is built to solve. So this is the, this top level here, this equation, is that energy equation that I can describe. This V is the coordinates. So you can imagine this as being the you know, GPS coordinates on our landscape, or in the case of the pipeline example, this is whether or not a particular junction is involved. You'll notice here that there is a quadratic interaction. So there is an interaction between two variables uh, in our coordinates. There's a linear interaction, which tells us the quality of each of our solutions. And then there's this constant, which is simply used to make the math nicer. So as I said, this is very mathematical and there's lots of documentation about this if you wanna dive into it. I simply wanted to share it with everyone so that you can understand that there is a mathematical underpinning for everything that we're gonna be talking about. So I'm gonna link this now to our pipeline problem. So before I mentioned that our coordinates are made up of as a vector of binary variables, so that's this V. This is a collection of binary variables. So in this case, I mean binary to mean either 0, 1, or negative 1 plus 1. So in our pipeline problem, our variables are each of the junctions. They either have a sensor or no. So that's binary. I'm going to go ahead and say that no sensor is a 0, and a sensor is a 1. Likewise. I mentioned before that we have these pairwise interactions between our variables and the problem. So if you look at our pipeline problem, our relationship is fundamentally pairwise. There is an edge, every edge needs a sensor. So there's a relationship between the variable that says whether there's a sensor at two and a variable that says whether there's a sensor at three. Next, we have our linear term. So this is a linear uh, cost over the individual variables. So we wanna pay a price for each of these sensors. So that means that if I have, I, I'm gonna pay $1, say, for each of these sensors, I wanna to try to minimize that. So back to our energy equation, we fundamentally want to minimize this value. So I'm, if I have a cost here of $1 for each sensor, for every sensor that's a one, I'm gonna pay $1. And so the quantum computer attempts to minimize that, trying to save as much money as possible. So if that seemed a little fast and you're interested in learning more about it and you want to sort of you know, explore it at your leisure, I will point out that this pipelines demo that I've been referencing is available in our library examples currently at GitHub. You can find it at github.com slash dwave examples. In this, you will see there are, I believe, 10 or 15 different examples of sort of uh, application problems. So things like satellite placement or coloring maps or job shop scheduling or this pipelines example. I'll also point out that more on the way, we are constantly trying to add to it and we're trying to improve it all the time. We're also in trying to improve the navigability of our examples and hopefully things will be coming soon to, to help with that. We also would really like people to contribute more examples. So if you have an application that you're currently trying to solve 
or that you've solved on the D-Wave system, we would love to add it to our example so that other people can benefit from it. So now I want to talk, try to, so I talked about one specific problem, which was this monitoring pipes problem. But I want to try to give you a sense of how that fits within the greater scope of problems that we can solve on the D-Wave system, because D-Wave really wants to be and is the practical quantum computing company. We want to work with applications, customer applications. So this monitoring pipes problem, as I mentioned before, is fundamentally binary quadratic model-like. So you'll recall from a few slides ago that binary quadratic models are the style of problem that ocean, the lower levels of ocean are designed to solve. And as I highlighted two slides ago, the pipelines problem is very much like that. It has fundamentally pairwise interactions. It has a linear cost over the variables. And so it's very easy to cast to a binary quadratic model. And it turns out actually that there are a lot of problems like that. So for instance, if you signed up for LEAP right now, you would be able to check out our signed social network demo. So this is a demo that will walk you, that makes use of the quantum processor in real time and walks through how to, sign, how to solve a signed social network problem using the D-Wave system. This is also a very close to BQM-like problem. Some other problems that are in this sort of sphere that you can check on our GitHub are things like our configuring satellites problem. This is also fundamentally BQM-like. And I should mention that I've called out five examples here. I've also included portfolio optimization and switching antennas, but fundamentally there are a huge number, I mean, almost infinite sets of problems that are very much BQM-like. But there are also problems that are a little bit more abstract. So taking a step back from our BQM-like problems, which now I'm, I'm moving that circle into here, we have other sort of classes of problems that violate some of the rules that I described. So these are things like solving Sudoku puzzles, which is a constraint satisfaction problem. In that case, our variables are not necessarily binary, but we can still map them to a binary problem. We can still solve them with the D-Wave system. Also things like job shop scheduling, facility location problems, uh, integer quadratic models. These are all different abstractions of the of classes of problems that you might want to solve that can be mapped to a BQM and then solved on the D-Wave system. All of these problems, though, what they have in common is that fundamentally I am attempting to solve a optimization problem. I want to find the minimum set of junctions to monitor pipes, or I want to find the fastest truck routing problem, or I want to solve the Sudoku exactly. Having you know, a couple of violations in the Sudoku problem is not good. I need to have the actual solution. But taking a step back even further from that, we have different problem types that we can access with the D-Wave system. So again, you can see at the top are monitoring pipelines, which is, as I said, a type of optimization problem. And then further down is a BQM-like problem. But we also have, we can also solve machine learning problems on the D-Wave system. So this is things like feature selection. There's also material simulation. So we had two papers uh, about a year ago on solving um, topological phenomena and lattices, which is material simulation problem. And these are all different sort of problem domains that can be accessed by D-Wave. And so if you walk away from this webinar with sort of anything in your mind, one thing I really want you to know is that although I showed how to solve this pipeline problem on D-Wave, D-Wave is applicable to a large set of problems and Ocean can be used in a very similar way with similar number of lines of code to solve a large, large variety of problems. And we really want people to come in and get engaged and try to solve their problems that way and then share with others how they did it. So finally, I will mention that you know, D-Wave, you know, to sort of back this up with uh, what customers have been doing already, we have actually, I believe as of uh, a couple of days ago, this, is, this slide should now say 200 plus early applications, where these are applications by customers. So these are things like papers or proofs of concepts or code or GitHub repos. I mean, there's lots of different things of solving problems on the D-Wave system over the last few years when they've had access to this. So this is everything from the satellite placement that I mentioned, but including things like internet ad placement. In the machine learning, we've done, they uh, did some interesting work on image recognition or DNA binding. In cybersecurity, people have done things like formation of terrorist network detection or fault detection. On the materials uh, properties, people have done quantum molecular dynamics, lots of different things that people have solved with the D-Wave system already. So I mentioned before, that uh, the future of, com of computation, and especially the future of quantum, is hybrid. Fundamentally, we want to be using uh, both classical and quantum resources to solve problems. 
And so I want to right now though, because that's really easy to say, but I want to try to make that a little bit more real. And I want to try to give people a flavor for what that might mean. So before I do that though, I want to point out that we have our D-Wave hybrid package. D-Wave hybrid is a hybrid asynchronous decomposition sampler framework, which is a very, very fancy way of saying it's a Python package that is used to leverage quantum and classical resources. The way to think about this is that you, there are, when you go to solve a problem, there are atomic steps. You need to have a solver. You need to have a set of pre-processing steps. You need to have some ways of manipulating the problem. And D-Wave Hybrid allows you to manipulate these different things easily. So you can very easily solve your problem both on a quantum computer and on a classical uh, algorithm concurrently. D-Wave Hybrid allows you to swap back and forth very, very easily at, at a very high level and then to dive in onto the areas that you think you can bring value to that workflow. So you don't need to worry about how you're accessing the quantum computer, that's being handled for you, but if you're an expert on how to map your problem into a machine learning context, you can solve that problem and then plug that into the D-Wave hybrid framework. This is motivated by the fact that very often, at least previously before D-Wave hybrid, when you wanted to implement a algorithm, you would need to start with a fairly complicated piece of pseudocode you would then need to implement that in potentially many, many thousands of lines of Python or C++ to get that to work. But with D-Wave Hybrid, this is an actual Python D-Wave Hybrid program that we've put on the right. So this is an example of what a hybrid program looks like on the D-Wave system, uh, or sorry, using D-Wave Hybrid. So your problem can come in, you can then run it on a classical resource. So this would be the Taboo Sampler. You can then simultaneously run it on the QPU. When the QPU answer returns, you can interrupt your taboo and then take the best answer from both, decide if your answer is good enough, and then either redo that whole loop until you have a good enough answer or exit. By doing this very simple loop, you can get the best of both CPU and QPU-based performance for your problem. If this D-Wave hybrid stuff looks kind of familiar, I will point out that we actually have a whole webinar based on D-Wave Hybrid, which I've included the link here and we'll add it to the YouTube link when we post it. Um, but I won't go too much further into the specifics of the D-Wave Hybrid platform because I'll just refer folks to that. And this, this, that webinar is excellent. So now I wanna motivate some of the different types though of, comp of, D of hybrid. So there is an instantiation, which I'll include here. So this is actual D-Wave Hybrid code here in the bottom right. But I want to give you an idea of some of the different things you might use hybrid for when trying to solve problems on the D-Wave system. So the first and most obvious is, what if your problem is too large to fit on the quantum computer? The thing you might want to do then is to find a sub-problem that that's a very important. So find some subset of your overall pipeline, you know, some knotted section near the city that's really, really high impact and really important, and solve that on the quantum processor and then reincorporate that solution into the overall problem. This is called decomposition. And this is how one of the ways that we can approach tackling problems that are too large to fit on a single quantum processor call. Another type of hybrid programming is what we call pre-processing. So in this case, um, imagine that you know something about the structure of your problem. You know that, oh, if I have uh, a simply a line of pipes that are connected sort of end to end, that I know exactly how to monitor those. I don't really need, that's not a hard problem. I know I just need to put a junction every other pipe. You can do that as a pre-processing step before sending that to the quantum computer. So this is the idea of solving some easy part with the classical before asking the quantum computer to solve the hard part. Similarly, and the dual of that, is doing post-processing with quantum computing. So, the quantum processor can be used to find a pretty good solution very fast, and then you can pass that solution as a initial state to a classical algorithm. That allows the classical algorithm to sort of drill down, maybe to run downhill or do some other interesting move based on the acceleration by the quantum computer. Because as you can sort of see in the bottom left here, and there's you know, interesting papers that you can find on the D-Wave system website about this, the quantum computer you know, returns a pretty good solution in a very short amount of time on the order of a couple of microseconds. This allows you to get a good seed solution to, you, to improve your burn-in rate for various classical algorithms. The, the last type of, well, the second to last type of, of hybrid uh, coding I want to talk about, which I think is the most exciting, 
is meta-algorithms. So before, a couple slides ago, I talked about decomposition. This is the idea of breaking out some part of the problem and then solving that on the quantum computer and then reincorporating that solution into your overall solution space. Meta-algorithms are instead trying to learn something about the overall structure of the problem, not just a chunk, and then distilling that down to some particularly difficult nugget, solving that on the quantum computer, and then reincorporating that into your classical algorithm to make a interesting or you know, non-local move. A great example of this, and this demo is available on our GitHub website, um, is Qboost, where you use the quantum computer to build a strong classifier from a selection of weak classifiers. So this is machine learning uh, stuff where you, you have a set of different weak classifiers, so simple ways to detect features on a data set, and you wanna pick the best set of weak classifiers for some number to use. This was co-developed with Google and was used to train image classifiers on cars. The last type of uh, hybrid that I'll mention, which isn't really an algorithmic thing, but it is important for saving on resources, is what we call racing. So this is the idea that when you submit a problem to the quantum computer, you are making a call to leap. You are contacting a remote resource. And so while that's happening, and while the, the problem is being sent over the internet and then processed by the quantum computer and then returned, your system is sitting idle. And it would be nice and advantageous to use that system to solve problems, uh, to, to try to make progress on the solution. So that's what this racing branches is. So the idea is we submit the problem both to the QPU, but then also to a local sampler running on your system. And then when the QPU solution returns, we simply interrupt what's happening locally and we take the best answer from each. In this way, you're not wasting any resources and you're getting the benefit of both quantum and classical resources to solving your problem. So that concludes sort of the, the fairly fast introduction to quantum computing with, with Ocean. So now we're gonna be opening this up to questions. I covered a lot of ground fairly quickly, and I would love to answer questions from folks uh, about the system and, and about really anything to do with D-Wave. Okay, well, thanks very much, Alex. Um, we do have some questions that came in while you were talking, but if folks have other questions, uh, please put them into the Q&A box and we will attempt to answer them in the time that we have left. So let's see, I'm gonna, uh, I will also unmute our panel here so that we have uh, some additional experts. Does the panel wanna say hello? Hi. Hi there. Hi, Hi hello. Okay, we have a very, very diverse, very expert panel. Um, so first question I guess is going to David Johnson. Can our programming code be used with, be used with Ocean tools? Sure, so um, in general, Python is the only supported language. Um, we have had instances where people have used uh, a third party library to integrate with other languages, such as MATLAB. Um, so if you just do a quick search online for calling Python from R, um, I found a couple of libraries that, that um, can do the trick. Sometimes there's limited functionality and you can't get all of the, all of the functionality out of the, the tools, um, data structures and things like that can be limited in some of the other languages or just restricted. So that's something to keep in mind, but it is possible to integrate with R as far as I can see. I would, we wouldn't encourage it, but if you really need to, it's possible. Okay, thanks. Next question for Melody. Are there any programs or tools available that allow me to convert, uh, create a program on D-Wave, try it out, and then convert the program so that it can be run on one of the gate level machines so I can examine the quality of solutions between the different systems? Um, so we don't really have any tools to convert or study any arbitrary problem in both systems, but we do have a paper that reproduces a study that was done on Rigetti. It's, we will post the, post the link to the paper in the chat. So you can look at that and see how one can convert between icing problems that they're applicable for D-Wave and a gate model system. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question for Joel. How do you know if your problem is too large for the quantum computer? What are you counting or measuring? So you're counting basically the number of variables in your problem and the density of the interactions between them. So you have about 2,000 qubits 
And they're connected in a particular topology uh, called the chimera, which is not fully connected. So if you have a fully connected problem, you can go to about something like just over 60 variables fully connected, but for sparse problems, you can reach a much higher number. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, I don't know who this is going to, but is there any guideline or procedures on how to formulate a problem to BQM? And I can answer that one. Go ahead. Um, so yes, there are. Uh, you can check out our getting started guides, uh, which are on the, uh, the tools and the documentation that I linked. So that'll give you an idea of how to take some different problem classes to BQM. I will say that in general, you're looking for essentially binary variables to be in your solution. So things like uh, I have this junction on or off, or I am including this uh, stop, I am having this truck stop at that place. Or not. Um, but there, there are sort of known ways to translate different problems. And then I'll also point out that we have a set of tools that sort of reach into different graph theory and constraint satisfaction areas um, that you can go check out. And you can, they're written in such a way that you can go look at the source code and see how we are translating those problems to get an idea of how you might translate yours. And then finally, on our uh, website, there's a whole set of different papers that talk about how to map just a huge variety of different applications to the D-Wave system. So, so basically, you know, for a new problem, you might be the first one doing that mapping, but there's a lot of templates you can use to help uh, guide that. Okay. And I'd also like to add that they should look at the Jupyter, at the Jupyter notebooks underneath for some examples. And especially there's a problem solving handbook um, and the system documentation that can also provide a lot of information on that. Totally. Okay, next question. Is this cube boost a classical equivalent of XG boost? <laughs> I'm not actually sure the answer to that. I'm not sure. Does one of our panelists know? Um, so I was just looking up XG boost on Google, so I don't know about XG boost. Um, but it seems like XG boost is by classical, we mean classical computers as in um, binary values with one and zero. There's no superposition and there's no. Um, quantum involved. And when I was looking at XG boost, it doesn't look like they're using um, any quantum mechanics at all. So I'm not sure what the question is asking. Um, in terms of QBoost, um, QBoost is a machine learning algorithm. And um, in our D-Wave examples account, we have a QBoost example where we have integrated um, the use of quantum computer. Actually, so we got someone else in the panel that says the answer for XG boost is no. It's not the equivalent of Q boost. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> panel breathes a sigh of relief that someone knows the answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, how do you decide which answer is best, quantum or conventional? Generally speaking, the, you know, so that equation that I showed a couple, like, you know, near the beginning of the presentation defines an energy or a cost for each of the solutions. And so generally speaking, you're looking for the lowest cost solution. Um, there are some exceptions to that. So for instance, in the material simulation, you might be trying to characterize statistics over all of the solutions. But generally speaking, um, whichever one has lowest cost is the one you're looking for. And that may come from quantum or classical. OK. Uh, next question, is there a dictionary for all the different commands of the Python libraries and the possible required parameters? Uh, so we have documentation for, for Ocean for our Python libraries. Um, and just doing a quick search for uh, D-Wave Ocean documentation should bring that up. I think that's what they're asking. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Okay, next question. I'm interested in inverse problems. Which optimization code is a good starting point, e.g. in your GitHub? The factoring circuit would be a really good way to do that. So mm -hmm. the way that we implement factoring on the D-Wave system, and I'll mention that you can also check out our uh, demo on Leap, as well as the Jupyter Notebook on Leap for this. There's a lot of resources for that. Um, but the way that we solve that problem is to uh, encode a classical circuit, so uh, in this case, a multiplication circuit, and then to run that backwards, so to invert it. Um, so that would be the, probably the place to start. Okay. How can we map a neural network onto D-Wave Leap? I'll take that one, I guess, then. Um, so <coughs> there, there, we have a couple papers. One of the things that we, an example, sorry, let's try that again. 
An example that we would like to add uh, is something called a restricted Boltzmann machine, which is something like a machine learning application um, that, that one could use to, to, to solve machine learning problems onto the D-Wave system. Um, I will say that not no one in the panel, as far as I know, is a machine learning expert, unfortunately. Uh, we weren't able to get one of them for, for us uh, today. Um, but we would like to add more examples in that area. And there are a set of papers uh, available on our website to, to look at sort of doing various neural network problems onto this, on the system. Okay, next question. If I do iterations with a QPU, how fast can I do it? What is the expected time I will be waiting in a queue? It really depends on how busy the queue is. So generally it's not busy. Yeah, generally it's not that busy, but if you hit a time where someone is submitting a lot of problems, then you might end up waiting a lot because we usually interleave the problems, but it really depends on what you submitted. And you also have to take into consideration the network latency, yeah. so that'll be a big factor. Mm -hmm. I'll just add that, you know, we're, we're, when we say a long time, we're talking on the order of, you know, 30 or 40 seconds. I mean, we're not talking, you know, hours or anything like that. And, and you know, we, we can scale the number of QPUs available in Leap to, to make sure that that time stays low. Um, so, so in general, you know, it can be as fast as a second and it can be as slow as maybe 10 or 30 seconds. And if a system's like truly being slammed because somebody's solving a lot of problems, it might be slightly longer, but generally well under a minute. Okay, uh, I don't know if we have any finance experts here, but a question, what are the portfolio optimization applications for Cubo when used in the context of, say, efficient frontier determination? A Markowitz efficient frontier application. I'm not familiar with efficient frontier uh, application or, or I'm not, so I'm not familiar with that term. Um, I believe we have, there is a paper available and actually uh, I can also plug, we have a, um, uh, a website uh, that shows off some of the presentations at one of our Qubits conferences. And there is a portfolio optimization uh, presentation there that I could refer you to, and, and we could add a link in the uh, chat. If yeah, one of the panelists actually, could please do that. I'm glad you, glad you mentioned that. Um, so twice a year, we do user conferences that's called Qubits. And our qubits.com website, qubits.com, has many of the user presentations that have uh, occurred for the last several years, qubits. We do one in the US and one in Europe. Um, so there's a lot of material there. And as Alex said, there's at least one and maybe two uh, presentations that were done uh, on portfolio optimization, including uh, one that was just done this past uh, September. So take a look there. Um, and there's really a lot of good examples of the kinds of applications that people are working on. And yeah, and, and, and I'll just sort of re-highlight something uh, that I, I mentioned in the, in the talk earlier, which is that, you know, there's, there's a huge set of problems that can be mapped to the D-Wave system. And, and really, a lot of what we are uh, doing and trying to do here is to simply, you know, get the community to talk to each other because there are whole sets of experts in, say, portfolio optimization that have worked on the D-Wave system that, you know, know way more about portfolio optimization than I could ever learn or anybody on the panel could ever learn. And, and really, what we'd like to do is to help connect those people so that they can then share their, their knowledge with the rest of the community. So we'd be really excited if you're if you're interested in that kind of thing to get involved with that and to you know make an example on the D Wave examples GitHub or or you know publish a paper or anything like that. Okay, a question for Luca. If I'm interested in writing a research proposal with D Wave, can this be done? Yeah, uh, so absolutely. Uh, the first thing that I would recommend is signing up for a free leap account if you haven't done that already. Um, so with the free leap account, you get. Uh, one minute of QPU access, and if you agree to uh, open source your code and give a, your GitHub account, you can get a recurring uh, kind of refill of that one minute per month. Um, and that actually gives you quite a bit of uh, resources to um, you know, develop your first uh, tests. And then from there, um, I would encourage you to go and uh, look at the upgrade options and contact uh, Leap Sales. We'd be happy to um, talk with you about um, research and uh, development upgrade plans. Uh, on that, Luca, can you kind of give people an, um, a little example of uh, what a minute of QPU time equates to in terms of the number of problems that can be run? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know if anyone has the Leap dashboard open. It's, 4, uh, yeah. it's about 4,000 problems. You can yeah, see. it's on the order of thousands of problems, depending on how many reads, uh, how many iterations you go through. But it's definitely enough to get you uh, started with an, a test application. Okay. 
Uh, so here's a question, which interest industry stands out as the biggest user of D-Wave solution? That's a great question. Um, I think the one that's most interesting, I'm not sure in terms of like total QPU time, um, that, that I, maybe someone in the panel knows, but one of the biggest users these days are various material simulation uh, industries. So they're trying to do things like protein folding and, and that, sort of, uh, that sort of thing where you're using the D-Wave system as an optimizer to help find a good protein packing. Um, so I would say that right now that's one of the sort of hottest industries. Um, I'm not sure what actually, maybe someone in the panel knows what the most QPU time is used by though. Yeah, I mean, I certainly would say that there's been a tremendous amount of uptake within the uh, automotive and manufacturing uh, world. So Volkswagen, for example, has done a lot of work on systems, but if you just kind of Google automotive and, and quantum computing, you'll see many of the big uh, automotive companies because they have problems, everything from battery research to logistics to optimization. Um, so certainly we see a lot there. Obviously there's a lot of kind of national labs work going on as well. Um, and uh, again, if you take a look at our website and take a look at qubits.com, you'll certainly see a range of them. There's also a set of companies doing, you know, things like internet ad placement and, and targeting based on. Correct. Industries really. Here's a good question. Is, is scalability the reason why there are only early use cases? Uh, I mean, I think that the size of the processor is definitely something that can be limiting. And, and you know, part of it also though, is that there aren't yet a lot of sort of best practices in the area. We, this is a brand new field. I mean, quantum computers uh, have been available in the cloud now for a little over a year. Um, so, so both there's a, you know, the, the, the processor right now has uh, two, about 2000 qubits in it and our next generation processor is targeted to have about 5,000, which is just about the level where you start hitting customer application sized problems somewhere between 2000 and 5000. So, so up till now we've been limited by the, the number of qubits. But the other thing that, that, that I mentioned just a moment ago, which is also important is that there aren't, there hasn't really been the software up until recently to really connect to customer applications. And, you know, as you can see from the way that we're asking for, you know, pull requests and examples, and, you know, we're looking for feedback is like, we're really over the last couple of years starting to get engaged with customers plugging into their stacks in a non, you know, in a commercial sense, not a research sense. And, and, and that's an ongoing process that, that is really only starting to reach its tipping point in, around now. Okay. Uh, can we write C and C++ for Ocean API? <laughs> the short answer discussed. is that we don't have a C client right now. However, under the hood, um, if you take a look into the Ocean source code, you'll actually see that significant portions of uh, the code are written in C. So the approach that we've taken is to, you know, benchmark Ocean programs and customer applications using Ocean to find out where most of the sort of classical computation time is taking place and then to, you know, accelerate that, that performance with C. So, so there's definitely opportunities to do C programming uh, within Ocean. We also would very much like to have a C client uh, in the future, but there's no timeline right now for that, but it is something we're very much thinking about. Okay. Uh, pe people have studied quantum materials with this system. Has anyone looked at quantum algorithms such as Simon's algorithm? I'm looking at the panelists, Michelle, who's our quantum materials expert. <laughs> Sorry to call you out. Um, yeah, from the silence, I don't think that anybody on our panel has heard of that particular algorithm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. Sorry. All right, next question. Do you plan to extend D-Wave Network X package to support more of the functionality which is available in the original Network X package? Uh, yes, absolutely. We would love to do that. Um, you know, there's a whole set of algorithms in Network X that we'd like to plug into, and that is something that we intend to do. But we'd also, like, that's one of our, that's, I think, one of the best first pull requests one can make to, to Ocean, which is to, to sort of just figure out how to build the BQM from one of these graph libraries. So, so yes, we'd love to get that. Um, we do make extensive use of network X. It plugs in. So for a lot of stuff like plotting uh, graphs or, or various graph manipulations, we obviously rely on network X for that. But for the different algorithms, yes, we intend to continue. And yes, we would love to get pull requests to do that. Okay. Uh, can, you, can you provide an overview of the main features of the different available samplers in the infrastructure? 
sure. Um, so the samplers that are available in the infrastructure, so obviously there's the QPA sampler, which is our D-Wave sampler object. Um, that is distinguished by the fact that it accesses a quantum computer. Um, some of the other samplers we have, so we have simulated annealing and taboo. These are classical algorithms that, you know, well-known classical algorithms for, for solving DQMs. Um, I would just encourage you to, to you know, it would probably be easier to look at the Wikipedia article than for me to describe them, other than essentially they're built on different techniques for walking over that landscape I was mentioning before, um, where earlier in the algorithm, um, you are more willing to walk uphill, while as later in the algorithm, you're essentially walking only downhill. Um, in addition to that, we have a set of sort of um, unit testing or testing samplers. So these are things like we have a brute force solver, which just simply tries all possible answers, um, which is useful for, you know, very, very small problems and unit tests. And then finally, I'll mention that our D-Wave hybrid comes with a few samplers, especially the Kerberos sampler, um, which is sort of the, it runs all of the other samplers as well as contacting the QPU. It's kind of the, I want to throw everything I've got at this problem. Alex, I'll also add that in the oceans getting started, there's a table that provides a list of samplers and where they should be used to get started with. Yeah, thanks. A uh, question for Joel. Can you speak about the error of D-Wave solution? How to mitigate the impact of the error? And are there any built-in procedures for error correction? So there's quite a lot. And so I want to point the, the, the asker out to two books that speak specifically about that. Uh, under the system documentation, there's the technical description of the QPU that explains the different sources of error. And um, the handbook for pro uh, the problem solving handbook, which uh, explains how you use those and incorporate them uh, in order to get over those errors. Okay, thanks, Joel. Uh, how do you decide if a machine learning problem is better suited for running on a QPU instead of a GPU? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Um, we actually have, I, I have sent the answer to one of our experts here at D-Wave, um, Hussein Saibanki. And um, so he had said currently problems that require sampling from the Boltzmann machine or um, general, are generally undirected graphical models over binary variables run very well on the QPU. Okay, question for Luca. We have a materials application which just doesn't seem to fit in 2000 qubits on the 2000Q system. Will the newer machine be available as a solver via the cloud in the future and any idea when? Hi there. Um, I'm just going to give a, a simple answer to this, and maybe some other people can chime in. Um, but I'm going to kind of repeat what was on the um, the press release here. Uh, so the new um, Advantage uh, solvers uh, will be released on the cloud system, and uh, right now we're looking at about mid 2020. Um, and in the meantime, I would recommend that if you're having problems just fitting the problems onto the, um, the QPU itself, that would be a good candidate for the hybrid algorithms that Alex was talking about. It increases your ability to um, solve problems that are just a little bit too big for the physical hardware at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there examples of solving scheduling problems via D-Wave? For example, assigning nurses to shifts in a hospital or instructors to classes in a school? Cool, that's a great question. We actually have an example um, called job shop scheduling. Um, under, if you go on GitHub to and search for the account D-Wave examples, um, we have a job shop scheduling problem, and then that would solve these types of scheduling problems with the QP. And another place is in the getting started for Ocean, you can see also a scheduling problem as one of the beginner's examples. Yes, yeah, so we would probably um, leave a link for that. Um, on the, the, yeah. on the YouTube, probably. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think hopefully I get this question right. About a not defined objective function in simulated annealing using quantum annealing hybrid methods, can such a problem be approached? Can that kind of a problem be solved? Can, sorry, Susan, can you repeat the question? It says about a not defined objective function in simulated annealing. Um, I'm not 100% sure that I understand the, the question. Okay. Well, if the, uh, uh, the 
person asking would like to try again, we will try and get to it. Um, we have about five more minutes before we're going to wrap up here. Um, can, you feed, can you feed real valued inputs to an RBM you mentioned using D-Wave? Yes. Okay, well that was simple. Um, thoughts on combining reinforcement learning with quantum? Oh, um, yes, we had asked um, Hussein about this, and he had said that um, one qubit has actually tried to do reinforcement learning um, with quantum computers, and we can put a paper to that as well. So it's uh, reinforcement learning with restricted Boltzmann machines. So we can add a link to that um, once this set, um, webinar is posted on YouTube. Right, and for those uh, that asked, uh, we are recording this webinar. It'll be posted to DOA's YouTube channel uh, in the next day or two. So uh, as Melody said, we'll be posting links to some of the papers. Uh, there's also on our website under resources, there are a lot of both third party and D-Wave papers uh, that are there. So take a look there as well. Um, is there a paper on feature selection application available? There's actually a Jupyter notebook that does it if you look under leap. Okay. Let's see. Uh, can the experts talk about how, in general, did the company translate their challenges, e.g., internet ad placement or image recognition problems, into something they can use D-Wave to try to solve? Uh, sure. I mean, in general, you know, the the sort of the way that we outlined the pipeline problem uh, is a way to think about this, where you know you're trying to translate your problem into something where your solutions can be expressed as binary variables. So. For instance, in the pipelines, that's each junction uh, gets a sensor, yes, no. Or for instance, in um, the traveling salesperson problem, this would be the, the salesperson is in New York City at uh, in January, yes or no. Um, the second thing that you're looking for is sort of pairwise interactions. So again, in the pipeline uh, example, this would be something like, um, you know, I, I, I need a sensor for each of these pipes, so it must be on one of those two junctions, which is pairwise. Um, and then for the traveling salesperson problem, say, um, I can't be in both New York and Philadelphia at the same time. Um, yeah, so, so essentially you're, you're trying to look to, to decompose your problem uh, into those, to reduce your problem rather into those uh, sort of areas or those sorts of restrictions or rules. Uh, and then to apply some, some optimization over that. So, you know, I want to visit, um, I want to have as few pipelines as possible, for instance, um, or I want to travel as cheaply as possible, for instance. So, in general, I mean, in the, in the best way I can summarize it in a couple of paragraphs, um, that's the way that you go about solving problems on the D-Wave system. Okay, I think we've got time for just two more. Um, here's a great question. What is the easiest entry point for learning quantum programming? There's two guys getting started, guys, that you'd want to start with. Well, first of all, if you're ready new to leap, you're, you're, it's good to run the demos and to try out the Jupyter Notebooks, the factoring and the structural imbalance. That'll give you a good idea of what's going on. And then there's a getting started guide under system documentation, and the Ocean has a getting started with beginner's problems that go up in difficulty and get you through a journey of how to understand how to use the computer yourself. Okay, yep. And as uh, he said, you know, we, if you haven't already, we encourage you to sign up for an account on Leap. You'll find all sorts of resources there, uh, uh, both interactive demos and documentation and uh, all of the uh, code examples that are both there and on GitHub. So those are certainly great places to get started. Um, all right, two more. Um, there might be about 60 qubits junction configuration limit. How can we solve complicated junction necessary problems? I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. I'm not sure if uh, one of the panelists. I think, this, I think this probably gets into the fact of how do you solve problems that are larger than will fit on the QPU. Uh, I see. Um, in that case, then, yeah, you're looking at various um, hybrid methods for doing that. Okay. Uh, there were uh, several questions people had in regard to the announcement we made about uh, DOA being available um, through AWS's bracket service. Um, I'm not quite sure if anybody on this call is kind of familiar with um, the timing or on that. Um, so I I'm say, not sure about the timing, um, but yes, you'll be able to access a quantum computer through through AWS and, and to buy time uh, on a quantum computer through AWS if, if you prefer that. 
Okay. All right. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, as I said, we hadn't done this before with an extended uh, Q&A session. We hope you found it useful. Um, you can certainly, when we post to uh, the video to uh, our YouTube channel, let us know what you think. Um, we do webinars just about once a month. Um, so the next one will be early 2020. And just as uh, Alex had said that we're always looking for feedback in terms of the products, we're also looking for feedback in terms of what would be most useful in terms of these webinars. So, um, you know, feel free to let us know. Um, and uh, we really appreciate the time that you spent today and we hope you found it useful. So take care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks to our panel and thanks to Alex. Thanks, everyone.